everyone, and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low-budget show. It's the show solo. It has no budget. Unlike every single thing we're going to be talking about this week, because it's an all-news episode again. I took a week off just because I needed to catch up, and I, I, had, a, I had a topic planned for this week where I'm like, okay, let's talk about this specific thing I could talk about. But instead, I decided let's actually get into some of this news because there's a lot of news I want to talk about. A couple of things that I thought, you know, I can talk about these a little bit more just because they interest me specifically. And I figured, you know, if if we were to do that, that could take up an entire episode. So that's what we're going to do. That is how we're going to do this. And it's going to be really fun. I guess. I don't know. Maybe maybe it won't be fun. I don't know. In particular, the news I want to talk about, we're going to talk about at the very end, which is the stuff with the Max. Uh, yeah, y- y- you should know at this point, if you've been following my channel at all, I love weird stuff from comic books, and I love seeing what's going to be adapted in weird comic book stuff. So I'm very excited about that. But we have a couple of movie stuff to talk about. Some big like shakeups that could potentially be happening in Hollywood. I say big. Some of them are big. Some of them aren't. A couple of comic book things. And then some casting announcement for some television stuff. Which is all very exciting. So first off, let's start with this. This, this news came out a little while ago. And I didn't know what to make of it. Because I'm like, ah, this could be anything. But... Apparently, the next Star Wars film that's going to be in active development this year is going to be Mandalorian and Grogu-oriented. Now, this could interfere with Season 4. It does not matter in the slightest what that actually means. But essentially, Jon Favreau will be directing a movie again. Finally, it's been... What was his last one? Was it Chef? I feel like he's done one since Chef. Or was that like right before, no, The Lion King. Yeah, he did The Lion King, which was 2019. But that's not like a real movie. But whatever. So The Mandalorian and Grogu getting a film that will be coming out probably 2025, 2026. This feels interesting. I think the biggest question about this is, is there crossover? I don't know the numbers for The Mandalorian. I don't know how those look. I'd imagine it's probably high up on the list for stuff happening on Disney Plus. Because it was like their first show to launch. But I I really don't know. Like, is that going to be anything to anybody? Is it going to be anything? It's very weird. Because I don't think it's... they. I think what they're thinking is that since it's the most successful show on their platform, it's going to mean it's going to do bank in theaters but i don't think there's crossover for that i can't imagine that having any major real crossover like i it's really interesting because i i think now like we're definitely seeing in terms of disney having a very poor year this year that them green lighting mandalorian and grogu feels like oh we need a safe bet to go to cinemas but if we get the mandalorian with a bigger budget in the way they filmed all of the previous Mandalorians, because I think since season one, the quality and content has definitely gone downhill just in terms of like the way the story is told and the way it looks like it looks worse. And that's not me criticizing things. I know how these work. It looks worse. That's not going to play well on a big screen. And I would argue you might tap out at 600 million at the highest, like you'd have I imagine for a Mandalorian movie going to cinemas you would have a great opening weekend and then probably like a 70% drop off in week two and then it's gonna do not Marvel's bad but maybe Marvel's bad like maybe there really isn't crossover for this because we we haven't had a Star Wars movie in theaters for about five years now so maybe there is no crossover that's completely possible And just because they've been so dedicated to the television side of things, maybe people aren't going to want to go to the cinema because they've been programmed by Pixar to stay home. Even Marvel stuff, you can watch Loki on your television. You don't have to go to the cinema to see that. It's all very curious to me. And I'd be very interested to see like what that actually turns out to look like. But 
I don't know. I really don't know. I think it could go either way. The way I'm leaning right now, the way the industry is shifting, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine a Mandalorian Grogu movie coming to cinemas makes a lot of money. I can't see that happening. And that's not really a shame. I don't really give a shit. If I had to have a list of like the upcoming Star Wars projects for Disney Plus I'd rather see turned into a movie, it would be Skeleton Crew or The Acolyte. Like I have no desire to really see that happen with The Mandalorian. Also, Ahsoka Season 2. I didn't watch the first season. It looks bad. It, it looks really bad to me. So I didn't watch it and I don't care. But there is some Star Wars news. The Rey Skywalker thing is still happening, but this is supposedly going to come out before it. This, to me, could just be, I don't know. I Like, worst case scenario, it's just an extended, like, theatrical run for, like, certain episodes of season four. Worst case scenario is, like, we take four episodes, tie them together, two and a half hour movie. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I wouldn't put it past this company that clearly is failing right now. Moving away from that, we have some other big news to talk about, which is honestly seismic. This is a huge deal to come out of the industry, and that is Mr. Movies himself, Tom Cruise. Well, a couple of things are happening with him. First thing we need to talk about is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is dropping the Part 1 moniker, which is a good idea. We are in a time period, especially now, especially in today's climate, People don't want to see a part one. We want a fully realized movie. You know, like setting up for a sequel isn't the best intention. And this movie does have an ending per se, but leaving that moniker behind is perfect. So just calling it Dead Reckoning, that's fine. You want to call the next one Entity or whatever, I don't care. So it looks like at Paramount, Tom Cruise will be having Mission Impossible 8, which whatever they're going to call that now, and supposedly Top Gun 3. This has been talked about for a bit now. It makes perfect sense why Paramount would want to do this. I mean, the movie was a huge success, a roaring success. It destroyed. It destroyed. It killed in ways nobody was really expecting. And they want to get Joseph Kaczynski back on. I think he's on board for whatever that turns out to look like. And then Miles Teller, Glenn Powell, and Tom Cruise to come back. So I think currently it's still kind of like they're attached, but it could be like whenever they're free because I'd imagine Cruise is busy right now doing Mission Impossible. Glenn Powell has a new up and coming project he's got to do circulation for, which we could talk about. Like Hit Hitman just got a release date for June. I think Netflix wants to try to push it a little bit, but that's a whole other conversation we don't need to get into. Miles Teller, I don't know what he's up to. Not that it matters, really. So, that's interesting. Like I think all of that is very interesting. And it could go well, right? I, I, I am, I'm not against Top Gun 3. I'm not particularly for it, because I think... You told the story with Maverick that you needed to, where it's both like the character and Tom Cruise letting the, the young guns take over, essentially, and having him come back for this. It might not feel naturalistic. I don't know. I wouldn't love it. But that is still a possibility. So if that is his next movie after Mission Impossible, that would be Top Gun 3 becoming the last movie Tom Cruise will be developing with Paramount because he has signed a new deal to have exclusive theatrical releases and set up production with his company over at Warner Brothers, which is very interesting. And I'm very surprised by this news in particular, considering how much Nolan hated the release of Tenet, where he left Warner Brothers to go to Universal the way that Cruz hated the release of Mission Impossible from Paramount, and he's now going over to Warner Brothers, who released Barbie. That is, that's very interesting. That gives me, that, that leads me into a few directions. One direction is Warner Brothers is desperate for a win. They just had the Barbie win. They want to recapture potentially the Barbie win with something Cruz could do. I could see that being the case. And two, the moment that they cancel something from Tom Cruise, 
is the moment I think Warner Brothers truly goes tits up. Like, I think you could see this on like a metatextual level. I don't think this is it at all. But you could see this as crews trying to maneuver Zaslav into making sure projects work. But also, I think Cruz and Zaslav are close to the same age, so the things that Cruz wants to make is probably the things Zaslav wants to make. So that's probably a good idea for those. I don't really know. I don't particularly love the idea of Cruz going over there. I would like him, I think, almost at any other studio. Maybe not like, well, 20th Century, I think, would let him do something. And I think Universal would be cool. Sony could use him. Freaking, he could come in and, and like, hey, Tom, we'll greenlight anything you want if you just show up and you're like freaking an unknown Spider-Man character for like one movie. Okay. I think Sony would be a good place for him. Columbia, Sony, that'd work. Paramount's probably his best bet still. But Warner Brothers, it's so interesting. It's such like a toxic place over there where just the very idea becomes this weird thing, this like weird thing to think about. I don't know. It's kind of confusing that he'd want to go that far. I don't know. Maybe they want him to do like an HBO thing? I don't know. Or could you imagine? They would never do it, but like a straight to HBO Max Tom Cruise movie? Oof, that'd suck. So that's going to be interesting to see what happens. Moving away from there, we're going to talk about a little bit of casting for key television series over on HBO. First off, Caitlin Dever has been cast as Abby in the second season of The Last of Us. Now, she is a young actress who is very talented and kind of one of those ones you're just like waiting to see what her big role is going to be, where she's going to end up. And already you can tell... This is going to be an intense role for her, and not just because it's a physically demanding role, but because the internet backlash, not just to her playing the role, but to the freaking character, is going to be insane. It's going to be insane. They also had a couple other casting announcements for some of like the supporting cast. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think Isabel Masser is going to be in it as well. It's just... <laughs> I'm so worried about this. Now, I think Caitlin is a strong enough person where she can take the heat. She's going to stay out of the spotlight a little bit, not become like a, a somebody of center stage, which is kind of impressive. And I think she'll do okay at that. I hope it works at least. I don't know. Maybe it, it will. Maybe it'll fail. But she's talented. I have no doubt she's going to get a fair amount of money. Is the backlash going to be like you know, looked down upon by the people at HBO and The Last of Us. I know Druckmann's kind of in like a bad position where nobody really wants to talk to him. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this is handled. Now, it could be handled well. And I, I, I think for the most part, when you have somebody like Pedro Pascal on your side, he'll be very helpful. I think him being in this series is going to help her feel more comfortable the way Bella Ramsey does. So that's that's good. I think that's all very good. So that casting, that was very interesting. But also, we have a bunch of casting to talk about for the next season of The White Lotus, which is a show I adore to no end. And we had a couple earlier ones, and then we had some later ones. So the first like kind of like wave of casting came from us in the form of Leslie Bibb, which is kind of interesting. Dom Hetrical, okay. Jason Isaacs. Okay, Michelle Monaghan, okay, Parker Posey, okay, and T Tammy Febmingfong, I, I don't know how you pronounce that name, and Natasha Rothwell will return as Belinda from the first season. So that is not a lot of characters of color, and when we get to the other announcements, kind of the same thing. But here's, here's what I love about this, Parker Posey is the perfect person to put in this scenario. She is perfect for this type of show. I have been waiting for Parker Posey's renaissance to show up. This could be the moment. Like, Isaacs clearly fits, like, a specific role they're going for. Same with Bib and Monaghan. I'm very curious to see what this season's going to look like with those casting announcements, because that could be anything. With Parker Posey, I could watch her do anything. I, I love that girl. 
I think she's awesome and perfect for a show like this. Like, I don't think she's going to perfectly bring like the Jennifer Coolidge energy, but she could do a very specific type of energy the way Jennifer Coolidge did, which is really fun to see. So on top of that, we had more announcements, including Walton Goggins, who is just a favorite over there at HBO. It's a good thing he got a gig like this. Goggins is so, he's another one of those names where you're like, that is perfect for this type of show. Sarah Catherine Hook, another one where you're like, yeah, okay. I mean, that makes sense to me. She's an up and coming actress, so I, I'm fine with that. Another white person, so that's cool. And Sam, who is this Sam? Nivola, I don't know, but that looks to me like another white person. Oh boy, oh boy. Patrick Schwarzenegger, who is taken off. Like, Gen V really put him on a lot of people's radar. I know he's kind of rumored right now for Hal Jordan, which I get it. Dude looks kind of goofy. I, I support it. He's definitely is going to be like a very specific energy for that show, too. And Amy Lou Wood, she's from Sex Education. And guess what? Another white person. I I guess this is like a white people show. Like, who were the characters? Were there characters of color that we really spent time with? In So the first season, they were in Hawaii. So there was like some native Hawaiian actors, like the young guy that hooked up with Sidney Sweeney's friend. And Belinda was in the first season, and she's a character of color. And then they're in Italy in the second season. We have like Italian actors, but none of them are really of color. So I guess this is like a white people show. I guess that's not surprising. Like a fancy vacation with like rich assholes. That's very white. So I'm I'm not against that. I guess it's not a surprise. Uh, but no, the only one that really gets me like, oh, hell yeah, is Parker Posey and Leslie Bibb to some extent. I feel like she will commit to like specific roles like that. You know, it's kind of fun. So that's kind of cool. I mean, that casting's... It's its as exciting as the stuff for The Last of Us. But not that much more exciting, you know? I don't know. It's weird. Uh, so here's something else to talk about. So another, I guess, kind of reboot that's on the horizon. Uh, 28 Years Later is in the works. Alex Garland teaming for sequel to their zombie hit. Oh, him and Danny Boyle. So the boys are back. Boyle and Garland are back. Are you having problems financing your weird movies, Garland? I'm not against anything Garland's made. Like, I liked Men more than a lot of people. And I, I like, you know, Annihilation just fine. Did he make another one between those two? Who can remember? He's, but Civil War looks so stupid. So I imagine like you play the game long enough to let you make your weird projects, which definitely feels like the case for Danny Boyle because his last movie was yesterday, the one about what if there were no Beatles. And he also made the Sex Pistol show, Pistol, which I thought was okay. That was out on FX and then they took it off of the streaming service, which kind of sucks. So these two coming back to the old stomping ground. Uh, potentially to turn this into a new trilogy. Uh, don't get your hopes up, boys. Like, the zombie genre isn't what it used to be. And uh, I don't know. Just don't get your hopes up right away that this is going to work. I don't know. I'm, I'm for it because I, I like both of those guys. And Boyle's, Boyle, I'm waiting for that next big thing from him. Like, I guess it also depends, like, what kind of era you like for your Danny Boyle. Do you like the classic, like, train spotting, grunge, just look at how gross, you know, Britain is and weird? Or do you like, I am making real movies like Steve Jobs and Slumdog Millionaire. I like all three of those. <laughs> so it's a mix, mixed bag. But no, this is kind of exciting. Like, there is something about that to get excited about with the boys coming back. But I don't know, like... Garland's in kind of a place right now where it feels like he wants to talk about something. So maybe him taking the 28 days later brand and using it to talk about the state of the world is a little worrisome. You know, I'd be worried. I Maybe my tune will change when I see what he does with Civil War. Because when that comes out, it could be like, oh, no, this is a great takedown of America. But this is a very like Euro grungy era of movies. So... I guess that'll be good. Maybe this means we'll get a 28 Days Later, like, 
restoration or 4K. So I think that's one. I could be completely speaking out of turn here. I might be because I'm not 100% versed in like all of the uh, shit going on with like uh, stuff like that. Did it get a Blu-ray? I'm trying to look. DVD, DVD. Okay, DVD. That's a widescreen DVD. There is a Blu-ray for it, but I don't see a 4K restoration. I mean, maybe it's the perfect time for that re-release and like a big bundle or something. That's kind of cool. Because I know this one was like kind of hard to find like a good copy of for a while. They only had like the standard definition. So this could be interesting to see. Maybe. I don't know. I could be, again, completely off base here. I don't really know this topic too well. Same with this one. Uh, Until Dawn is a video game that came out a few years ago. I know it's one of those games where it's like kids in a cabin and there's a when to go and it's like any action you take has real consequences. And they used actual actors for it. Like I know Rami Malek's in it and Hayden Penetier is in it. So it's kind of like a big deal or something. I don't know. Anybody else important in it? Maybe. It was one of the Ashmores in it. That's possible too. Uh, they're going to be turning that into a movie with David F. Sandberg directing. You're like, hell yeah, dude. You get as far away from the superhero mythos for a while. Now you go back to your roots. You start up strong. You come back and do something fantastic. So uh, we're going to see him directing it. That's really exciting. And, and it's just classic horror fun. Like that's all this is. When you come off a project like Fury of the Gods, you kind of want to go back to something classic and easy and something you can sink your teeth into, something that you can spin into a bunch of different directions because there is a narrative that is constantly shifting where you can kill different characters and change the way things are done. You could easily move that into different directions. Brett Dalton's in this game? Sorry, Peter Stormare is in this game? Jordan Fisher? Okay, like there's some people in here, if that's what I'm looking at. Uh, cool, I don't know. I, I think this is very interesting. I don't know if I'd want all of that cast to come back because they're kind of old now and I feel like we could get younger actors, but this is definitely the direction cinema's headed. We're just going to be adapting video games for a while, which is fine. You know, I have nothing against that, truly. I, I don't play enough video games to like really get offended by them adapting it. You know, when we get to <laughs> our final piece of news, that's when we'll talk about stuff but no i'm 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 interested i am genuinely interested in seeing what this could be because it could be good but chances are no i trust sandberg in horror i trust him in horror so that's good a couple more things to talk about this one this one i i i guess is for like my generation if you're interested in that i i I'm kind of upset, honestly. So, Wizards of Waverly Place is getting uh, a sequel. So, Disney, the Disney Channel has ordered a pilot called Wizards, and it is going to star David Henry, who played Justin, and I can't remember the name of, of Russo. Justin Russo. The basic premise is he's a, he's a dad now, and his kids are doing the thing he did. Okay. This has the same energy as Raven's Home, which I think was okay. I didn't hate Raven's Home. I think the basic idea for that show was fine. Getting Raven Simone back on Disney Channel is clearly something they wanted to do. They did some interesting stuff for that show for a bit. It kind of fell into the formulaic trap of like, oh, what is any of this? And then its audience definitely became this thing of like, oh, this is more aimed for the younger demographic than we are getting the old demographic back. So, I mean, what else is David Henry doing? Honestly, like, try it. And I think he revealed on, like, Instagram he wants to get, like, a lot of the old cast back together. So it was definitely an idea made out of pocket from the rest of the cast where he's like, I need to get Selena Gomez to produce it and potentially star in it, and that's all. I need. After that, we're going to be okay. And you're like, I guess so. So, Selena Gomez is going to 
be a recurring character showing up as like the sister or whatever. Uh, who, who knows? Let's see. The the the, rev, the revival pilot comes from the writers, executive producers. You have Jed and Scott. Yeah, of course it does. Oh, oh, they also did Raven's Home. Okay, it picks up a mystery. It picks up after a mysterious incident at WizTech, where an adult Justin Russo has left his wizard powers behind, opting for a normal human life with his wife and two sons. But he gets a surprise when a powerful young wizard in need of a training, in needs oh in need of training, shows up at his door, and Justin must embrace his past to ensure the future of the wizard world. That actually sounds worse than what I said to you. Like, ugh. Some, he's like, you're Justin Russo. Did Justin win it at the end? I know, like, the plot of, like, this show was, like, there's three kids and only one of them can have the power. Uh, I thought the youngest brother got it, but no, like, I guess, I guess Justin got it or did he, like, give it up and then Sam or fucking Alex got it? I don't know. I think about this show very scarcely and I think even when I was watching it I was kind of just rooting for the dad <laughs> David DeLuise I don't know uh, I, I mean Maria Canal Barrera is in it and David DeLuise so that's what I like I don't know hell I want to talk, I mean, it's my generation. It gave every person my age a crush on Selena Gomez. And for good reason. She was like the cool alt character. It's like edgy. And then her brother's like a stick in the mud. And then like their younger brother's like a dickhead or an idiot or something. I don't know. I barely remember the show. I guess it's good. If you like it, I'm, I'm here for you. That's really exciting. But you're not going to watch this. Let's not lie to ourselves, okay? Nobody... I'm just going to watch this. I'm still furious. Furious. I am so fucking pissed that we don't have the Lizzie McGuire show. Like, there are some new reports that came out where, like, you know, some plot revelations. Oh, my goodness. Lizzie McGuire's going to have sex and she's going to enjoy it. And it was like, what? We can't, we can't put that on Disney. I, I, I'm livid. I think that was actually a genuine idea because the the thing is that is the one that would have been the one where the audience would come back because the audience is watching this character actually grow up and do something more adult and become a part of something larger. That actually would have done something good, but Disney was scared because they're fucking it, it, they're idiots. But we'll get this shit, I guess. I don't know if it's going to get more than one season, but I genuinely don't care. I just wish I had the Lizzie McGuire show. And no, How I Met Your Father is not a respectable replacement because that was so tone deaf and missed the mark of what should have been the success that is, that is Lizzie McGuire. <sighs> I can't keep doing this to myself. It's going to drive me crazy. It, it upsets me so much. It upsets me so much. I don't know. Uh, moving away from there, this is something comic book related I do want to bring up because it is very interesting. Uh, the IDW Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series, which has been running for a long time. They're going to be getting to issue 150, which is almost unheard of these days. Uh, well, they're going to be relaunching the brand after 150, which, you know what, makes sense. We're entering like a new era of Turtles content, so why not relaunch the brand? But what's the most surprising part about this is the person that's going to be helming this relaunch is none other than legendary Marvel writer Jason Aaron, which I guess is a shock. I don't know Aaron's like connection to the Turtles. I don't, but like I, he just started doing something with Batman, so I guess he's branching out and doing other stuff. And this is probably a more lucrative deal than doing a Substack thing or what everyone else was trying to do for a minute. That is genuinely surprising. Like, I was like, oh my goodness, really? Aaron wants to do this? Okay. I'm all in for Aaron doing that. Like, I wanted to pick up the reboot anyways. I have I have trailed so far behind when it came to this series. Like, I, I know a lot of the new characters, but I'm so lost on a lot of it where I was like, I, I gotta just, you know, I just gotta calm down and get back into it. So, 
I'm excited. And today, actually, we just got the announcement of how the book's going to relaunch. So, essentially, what's going to happen is there is going to be a series of four issues, each focusing on one of the turtles. They're all going to be written by Jason Aaron, but they're going to have different artists on the books. So issue number one coming out in July is going to focus on Raphael, and it's going to be Jason Aaron and one of my favorite artists, Joelle Jones, which I'm like, hell yeah. I Like, that is a name. Joelle Jones, a name. I didn't think I'd ever see attached to Ninja Turtle stuff. So that's really cool. Come August, it's going to be Jason Aaron and Raphael Albuquerque doing Michelangelo, which is kind of cool. They let Raphael not do the Raphael book. <laughs> I like that. Very fun. In September, on the Leonardo issue, is going to be Cliff Chang and Jason Aaron, of course, which is like kind of cool. I also think it's going to be Albuquerque who does the ongoing story from like the next set of books. But in October, working with Jason Aaron on Donatello is going to be Chris Burnham, who he was the one that just did the Unstoppable Doom Patrol, if I'm not mistaken. That is so freaking cool. That's so cool. Like, that is, this is a fun idea. I'm kind of all in on this right now. Like, it makes me super happy. I'm just super impressed with, like, what could be coming from this. I hope it's going to be really cool and interesting. I have no doubt it will be, because it's Aaron and... Like, taking the Turtles into a bold new direction is something that they have needed for a while now. (laughs) And that's going to be cool to see what it is. And that would be a great place to end it. You know, we could wrap up talking about some cool comic book stuff. But something else happened in the comic book industry, and I don't know how long we're going to talk about this, but I have thoughts to talk about. The other day, over on his Instagram, Channing Tatum, your favorite guy, he posted a picture, multiple pictures, of the Max. And not just of the comic book, but of the MTV television series as well. So I'm going to read what Channing Tatum said. Oh my god, I'm so excited for this, I can't even explain. The Max. This is a childhood love of mine. The truly brilliant genius creation of Sam Keith. When I was grounded and wasn't allowed to watch TV, this was the only cartoon on MTV Oddities I would risk it all for, sneak out of bed and put put it on and pray I couldn't get caught. Even now, after all this time, it feels somehow ahead of its time. The characters in this, the Max, Julie, Mr. Gon, taught me things about life. Seeded complex ideas in a young mind that had a profound effect on how I viewed the world and the roles we play that I only intellectually understand in ways later. I can't wait to bring this to life and try to bring it to generations that missed it. I am so confused as to why this is happening. Now, here's the thing. The Max is a really interesting book. It is gorgeous in some specific ways. It is very, like, whimsical and in, in terms of, like, the artwork from, like, Keith, like, it's very whimsical and kind of cartoonish and goes into some very creative directions. But the story itself is so mature and kind of about, like, broken people learning to heal and how do you heal properly when everything around you is broken and destructive. It is a very specific tone. And here's, okay, here's the thing about this. One. If you were to do the max today, I I wholeheartedly believe this. If you were to do the max today, it could be one of those comic book properties that elevates the genre in terms of a general audience. I'm not saying like the boys where it's like, oh man, we're deconstructing, but like you're taking this limited comic book story that ran for like 35 issues and you're telling like this complete narrative and you're doing something so specific where like a general audience could be like, I didn't know this was part of a comic book. I thought it was like a weird twisted story about like this weird guy and how he's like connected to this like broken girl and how she helps him and he helps her. And it's like this weird story about connection and stuff. Like it could be one of those projects that elevates the genre. But at the same time, it could just be like a weird schlucky thing where it's like low budget and dirty and grimy and like this weird kind of like art house piece that's really specific and crazy 
And the perfect guy to play either of those versions is Channing Tatum because he doesn't play a smart guy. And the Max, like the homeless guy who wears the lampshade when Julie puts it on him, who becomes like this weird protector of the Outback, he's not like a really well-versed guy. He's just kind of like a schluck that shows up and things happen around him. And that is a Channing Tatum role. So if Channing Tatum is attached to play the lead, that is very exciting. I think he is one of the few actors today, like in this this system we've built, I would be genuinely interested in seeing playing the Max. Now, I had no idea this would even happen. Like, this is such a weird, specific thing that, again, it's like, who wants to do this? Does Keith want to do this? Because I know Sam Keith is kind of like, I don't know about the Max. Like, I, I know it's a... I know it's a thing, but I kind of phoned it in a little bit. I don't know why people think it's like some high art. And he's always one of those guys that's just like, he he doesn't trash talk his work. He doesn't like uplift it or talk positively about it. But he's just a guy that's like, I don't know. Like, why do you like this? I don't even like it. It's weird. Go try to think about it in a deep way. But there are deep ideas in there. Maybe not executed perfectly. I'm not like the most well-versed guy in the Max. It's one of those like early image books from like, not the first wave, but like very early on in the creation of image where it's like a creator had like some semblance of an idea and the people are like, okay, this is it. You know, it's a speculator's market. We can all just like make books and money off this stuff. And then they got a TV show out of it. And you're like, what? Why? But it's not like, like it's about like victims of rape and like monstrous beings and like the villains, like a serial rapist and serial killer. And it's, it's got, like, some weird whimsy to it at the same time and, like, weird creatures that, like, can enter our world and they change color and they distort. And so it's all weird. And it's like this girl dresses up like she's a jungle girl and she's inside her own outback and, like, her weird spirit protector is, like, this big hulking creature with, like, two middle fingers that are, like, claws. And you're like, this is weird, but there's, like, an actual message behind it, I guess. It's very bizarre. I wonder, now, I, I don't think because it sounds like it's moving forward through Paramount, and it's through um, a company that, that Tatum works with before. Uh, I don't know what his, what's his company? Okay. Uh, okay, Tatum and Roy Lee have teamed up to produce via three association. Okay. So my first thought was like, okay, is this going to be part of a renaissance we're seeing? Because McFarlane wants to do Spawn so bad. Like, he even said this year, if it's not up and running by this by A24 and Blumhouse and all that shit, I think it's Blumhouse, actually, then I am producing it myself. Because he wants to make a good Spawn movie. Now, I would, I would logically say the next one you would try to do would be Savage Dragon, but maybe Larson doesn't want to take Savage Dragon out of the comic. That could make perfect sense to me, too. But Keith is a guy who has just been so vocal about like the specific thing when it comes to the Max. He also doesn't seem like a guy who'd want to make a Max movie. But again, it, it has the potential to be one of those things that could elevate the genre. We are looking at this specific tome of comic books from an era where like everything was slucky and graphic and gratuitous and stupid. And you have this idea of like people learning to get better from their trauma in in some way through like this weird story i don't know but like this was such a big shock to me and it's not a book i would tell everybody to read because i think you have to be willing to go on the ride with the artwork you have to be willing to go through a guy figuring out what this actually is because it's very much keith having like one kind of main idea and when he gets bored of that and he sees people are kind of interested in seeing something else, he's like, I, I guess I can do this. Like, I'll say this too. Like, Tatum doing the Max, that's fine. You could get a really good actress to play Julie because Julie is a very complex character and you could do a lot of interesting stuff with her. And if you were to modernize this up a little bit, I think there's a lot more to talk about, which I think could happen. And Mr. Gone, I could... I, I, the book does weird stuff with him, but making him like a straight up freaky guy that you just want to see get his comeuppance, that could happen. I like this. So it's, 
a movie. I believe it's a movie they're trying to develop, which makes sense. Because then you could just do, like, the first couple of arcs and have, like, an actual conclusion. It's so, like, this is just bizarre to me. And as, like, a classic comic book fan, I'm just like, I see the potential. I can see this being special. Maybe it should be animated. But if you have a genuine budget behind it and you have people willing to commit to this, it could be that project where people go like, this is not standard comic book fare. When was the last time, like, we've seen that happen where it's not just like, I, I like, I would hesitate to say the boys. I know the boys has its fans, but the thing with the boys is it's ripping on the MCU and the DC universe and all that stuff. It's just making fun of that system and it's becoming its own cinematic universe or whatever and it's showing like the gratuity to it. Where there's like no real elevation of the material as opposed to just showing it in a more graphic way where the max is just like we are telling a specific story that can almost only be told in this format, in this style. Maybe animated was the way to go, but we also had the animated series in the 90s, so maybe that's not the way to go. It's very... I'm just... I'm just amazed by this because it's coming out of nowhere and it's so specific and I don't know what to think. I I don't know if I would do like a bunch of videos talking about the Max just because who's going to watch it for one and I better YouTubers and, and better critics have talked about it endlessly. But if you have ever been hesitant about the series, I don't think it's what you're expecting it's a little more like emotional through like this weird fantastical lens of like these weird creatures and stuff. There's something here. And Tatum is, in my opinion, the perfect guy to tell that story. Like I genuinely think he could pull it off. If anybody of that era could pull it off of his generation, it is Tatum because he's not like a smart character. He's just kind of like a guy that does things. And that is very Tatum. I don't know. This is genuinely interesting to me. I kind of dig it. But it could... I don't know. Like, this is unrelated, and I think we could do another video talking about this alone. But if you're, if you're telling me, like, within the next three years, let's say, let's say two years, actually, like, if this starts filming this year, or development happens this year, same with Spawn. If you're telling me by 2025 and 2026, we could have two classic image characters with big theatrical movies that to me is almost like the revitalization that this genre needs this could again a whole other conversation but from there you could imagine because also i know for a minute liefeld was doing one of his was it profit like Hall was attached to profit and i i guess i don't think larson was going to want to do uh his his savage dragon stuff and if we get the Invincible movie, that's a whole other thing as well. And the Wildcats and Wildstorm over at DC. And we're getting the Authority movie. So it's like that kind of era of like the classic, you know, image and Vertigo stuff could be getting bigger and better. Like I I think this could lead to even the offices of DC being like, okay, who do we have? Do we have, they have Fables. I think at some point in our lifetime, we're going to see them develop Fables. I could see that. I could see, you know, what's the Grant Morrison one where it's like a bunch of freaks? I don't know. But I think from that era of image, Shadowhawk could be like a good subversion of the, um, you know, Iron Man or the Batman thing. I could see that being the case. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever do Young Bloods. That's a little too stupid. But I'm trying to, what do we got here? Okay, the classic ones. Wet work, cyber force. No, I don't think we'll ever see those happen in some capacity. Because who wants to see that? But Max is a good one. The Max is the best one of these, of that era. All right, here's CBR's 10 most important image series of all time. What do we got? Tribe. Okay, yeah. I wouldn't be against Tribe. Wanted. They've done Wanted. The Max, yep, Invincible, yep, Astro City. Astro City, I, I'm specifically saving because I wanted, I, I love Astro City. My favorite comic book of all time. Uh, we can never make it today. We'll get to that later. Saga, absolutely somebody wants to do Saga. Whoever owns Saga, yeah, they're going to do Saga. Uh, let's see, Savage Dragon, Youngblood, Walking Dead, Spawn. 
Yeah, Walking Dead's fine. Spawn will happen. We'll never see Young Blood or Savage Dragon. Doesn't matter. The Max, it's awesome. It's cool. I recommend all of you to check out the Max if you're interested in, in good stuff or just interesting stuff. It's kind of in, it's interesting at the least. So yeah, see that took up a whole episode. We didn't need to talk about the other topics I wanted to talk about, which is fine. Uh, thank you all for watching this episode of The Geek Wave. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And of course, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck. <laughs>